Hello everyone, this is lecture 39 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. This series expands on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. It's available on Amazon. You can find a link in the description below. We are still in Chapter 6, Hypocalcemia and Hypercalcemia. And today we are going to start explaining calcium homeostasis. So what about intestinal absorption of calcium? The daily intake of calcium is approximately 1,000 milligrams. Obviously, it varies a lot between people. So let's say that we have 1,000 milligrams. Of that, 400 milligrams is absorbed in the small intestine. But 200 milligrams is excreted with the intestinal secretions. So we have a net intestinal absorption of only 200 milligrams. This is about 20%. Now, what's going to happen to the 800 milligrams? Well, it's going to be excreted in the stool. Now, 500 milligrams of calcium is exchanged daily between the bone and the extracellular fluid. Now, the kidneys filter a lot of calcium. 10,000 milligrams, but 9,800 is reabsorbed by the renal tubules. So this leaves us with 200 milligrams, which is exactly the amount that was absorbed in the intestine. So this way, if we have 1,000 milligrams, 200 milligrams are absorbed, the same amount is excreted in the urine, the rest goes to the stool, and we are in a steady state. Okay, so the net is zero. Now, let's look at this diagram. Again, if we assume that we have a daily intake of 1,000 milligrams, the intestine, the small intestine, is going to absorb 400 milligrams, but 200 is going to go back into the intestinal secretions, so we end up with a net daily uptake of 200 milligrams. 800 milligrams go into the, st the stool, fecal excretion, and then 200 milligrams go into the urine. The kidneys are going to filter 10 grams, 10,000 milligrams, and reabsorb 9,800 milligrams of it. And the bones have 990 grams of calcium. Both the intracellular and extracellular fluid have only 10 grams, and there's an exchange of 500 milligrams daily between these compartments, intracellular, extracellular on one hand, and the bone on the other hand. Let's continue. Intestinal absorption of calcium. In the small intestine, calcium is absorbed either paracellularly or passively through the tight junctions or transcellularly or actively. Now, paracellular absorption dominates when calcium is high. You don't need active transport then. While transcellular absorption dominates when calcium is low because you have to reclaim all that calcium actively. Now, these roots, paracellular and transcellular, we talked about the same mechanism with magnesium, and it'll be the same with phosphorus. Active absorption of calcium is always under the control of calcitriol. Calcitriol, like we said, is the most active form of vitamin D. It is 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3. How does transcellular calcium absorption occur? we need two epithelial channels, two epithelial calcium channels to accomplish that. They belong to the transient receptor potential superfamily, specifically to the vanilloid subfamily TRPV. These two channels are pronounced TRIP V5 and TRIP V6. Now, um, remember with magnesium, we talked about TRIP M6 and TRIP M7, so don't confuse these channels. So we have the calcium channels for transcellular absorption, and we have the magnesium channels for transcellular absorption. Okay, free calcium exits the cell via the sodium-calcium exchanger. Okay, so calcium goes out, sodium goes in. What about hormonal regulation of calcium homeostasis? Now, this is critically important. When you're talking about calcium, you have three processes. Intestinal absorption, you need to get calcium in, okay? 
How? Through the intestine. So you eat calcium from many different sources and the intestine will absorb it. Then you need bone turnover because the biggest reservoir of calcium is in the bone. So calcium, there's always this exchange with the bone. And then you have renal reabsorption because the kidneys, like we said, are going to filter a lot of calcium, but they have to reabsorb it. So we have an intestinal component, we have a bone component, and we have a kidney component. Remember these three. What about hormonal regulation? Calcium is tightly regulated, not like with magnesium, we didn't have a clear mechanism. With calcium, we have the parathyroid hormone, which comes from where? Okay, obviously the parathyroids. We have calcitriol, 125-dihydroxy D3, which again is the most active form of vitamin D. And we have serum ionized calcium. And then we have receptors for each of these, for the parathyroid hormone is going to be the parathyroid receptor. For vitamin D, well, it's going to be vitamin D receptor. And for ionized calcium, it's going to be the calcium sensing receptor. So we have three processes, intestinal, bone, and kidneys. We have three hormones, PTH, calcitriol, and we have ionized calcium. This is not a hormone. And then we have three receptors, the PTH receptor, the vitamin D receptor, and the calcium sensing receptor. Remember these, okay? Memorize it. And everything we're going to talk about uh, from this point on is going to involve the delicate interaction between these processes. What about the calcium sensing receptor? Calcium sensing receptor senses calcium, specifically ionized calcium. So this is a G-protein coupled receptor that regulates PTA secretion from the parathyroid gland. Now, it senses extracellular ionized calcium. Now, what's going to happen is the following. Let's say that calcium is high. Now, the calcium sensing receptor is activated. So when calcium is high, it's going to be activated. When it's activated, it's going to do something to lower calcium. So what's going to happen? Okay, first you're going to have an increase in renal calcium excretion or calciuria. You're going to have inhibition of PTH secretion because PTH increases calcium, but if calcium is high, we're going to inhibit it. Now, PTH inhibition is going to decrease calcium release from the bone. It's going also to inhibit synthesis of calcitriol in the kidneys. Now, when calcitriol is inhibited, is going to reduce mobilization of calcium from the bone and decreases active intestinal absorption of calcium and I have to add phosphorus. Now these effects will restore calcium towards normal. Okay. Now if this is not clear, please pause and repeat it. Repeat it 10 times. This is very critical. The opposite happens when calcium is low. So we're going now to reverse everything. Okay. Calcium is low the calcium sensing receptor is going to be inactivated. When it's inactivated, then there's going to be a decrease in renal calcium excretion because you need that calcium. You don't want to excrete a lot of it in the urine. Now, you are going to have, because it's in inactivated, an increase in PTA secretion. When PTA is stimulated, you're going to have more calcium coming out from the bone, increased release of calcium from the bone, you're going to have increased synthesis of calcitriol. What's calcitriol going to do? It's going to mobilize again calcium from the bone and increase active absorption of calcium. And then I have to add phosphorus in the intestine. So what's going to happen? Calcium is going to be restored toward normal. Now, calcium sensing receptor is not just in the parathyroid glands. You can find it in the basolateral membranes of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henley. And we're going to talk about uh, some more uh, some more in a little bit. Now, this is a schematic representation of the calcium sensing receptor. As you can see, uh, ionized calcium, free calcium will bind to the calcium sensing receptor. Um, you can see the extracellular portion, and then you have an intracellular domain. You have a cytoplasmic tail. This is the case with, with many receptors, actually. And it's a G-protein coupled, meaning something's going to happen to a cyclic AMP uh, down uh, with the signal transaction. 
So when you have a calcium mimetic agent like Sensipar, it's going to increase the, sens the sensitivity of the calcium sensing receptor to calcium. So is, you're going to have the effect you would have with hypercalcemia, even though there's no hypercalcemia, but it's going to sensitize the receptor. So what's going to happen is going to shut off PTH secretion, it's going to decrease calcitriol, you're going to have decreased absorption of calcium in the intestine and decreased release of calcium from the bone. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about treatment of hyperparathyroidism. Now, calcilytics have the opposite effect. They will decrease calcium receptor sensitivity to calcium and when that happens you're going to increase PTH, you're going to increase calcium release from the bone, you're going to increase synthesis of calcitriol and you are going to have increased absorption of calcium and phosphorus through the intestine and this is what we talked about in the previous two slides. Now let's summarize okay and we'll go back to these points again and again you really have to know it. So the calcium sensor receptor is in the parathyroid glands, also in the loop of Henle, like we said. So when, when the calcium sensing receptor is activated, okay, when there is a sense that uh, there is, say, elevated calcium, what's going to happen is going to shut off PTH, you're going to have decreased release of calcium from the bone, and you are going to have a decrease in calcitriol secretion, and then decrease intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphorus, and decrease also release of calcium from the bone. Now, on the other hand, when the calcium sensing receptor is deactivated, like uh, you would have in case of hypocalcemia, you are going to have an increase in PTH. When you have an increase in PTH, you are going to have more calcium release from the bone. You are going to have more calcitriol secretion or synth synthesis in the kidney and therefore increased calcium and phosphorus absorption in the kidney. Also, PTH effect on the kidney not only will it increase calcitriol, but also PTH decreases urine calcium excretion, okay, but increases phosphate excretion. So PTH is phosphaturic. Uh, so when calcium is low, PTH is going to preserve uh, urine calcium, okay, you are going to have a decrease in urine calcium. And all these effects are going to lead to restoration of calcium towards normal because you are going to have release of calcium from the bone, you are going to have less calcium excretion in the kidneys, and you are going to have increased absorption of calcium in the intestine. So I'm going to stop here and uh, we'll continue our discussion of calcium homeostasis in the next lecture. See you then.